All right, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on, guys. Amen. How many of you sense that this year just feels different? Is, is it, uh, it might be just that, that we're in 21 days of prayer and fasting, and what, but I just feel like this is, this is different, man. God is doing something, and I pray He is in you. I pray that this is uh, the beginning of the year seems different for you as well, and yet you're lifting your expectation and your faith, because I truly believe, you guys, that if we can fix our focus, then God can fix our future. So we started this this series with this, uh, this focus, uh, the year with our, our series focus. It's our word for the entire year. Um, we usually pick a word as God reveals. It's not every year, but as God reveals a word as a mantra for us, we, we kind of lean into that throughout the year. But we're in week three of this series, and I just love what God is revealing kind of one layer at a time. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper, uh, another layer. When I say deeper, I don't mean like, like it's going to be confusing. I mean, it's going to be very practical today, though, okay? A very practical word that I hope that you can grab hold of and it'll change your life. So let's go to our theme verse here. It's one of our theme verses for the series. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, if people can't see what God is doing, someone say focus. Because that's the goal, right, in our focus. Our focus is to see what God is doing. It's not that we would just get more clarity for our own sake or for clarity for any other sake, but we want to see this year more than ever, God, I want to see what you're doing. I want to see what you're doing, God, because if not, he says, we're going to stumble all over ourselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. And that's our prayer, that you would experience the most blessed year of your life as you fix your focus. So in week number one, we talked about really putting God in the rightful place, that we would focus on putting first things first, our priority, that, that God would be put first in every area of our life. And that actually, it's what it means to be Lord. He's, he's not Lord at all if he's not Lord of all. So we talked about like, okay, let's, let's focus on putting God first in every area of our life. And then last week, really what we talked about is, is getting ourselves in the right position or the posture or the place that we actually can receive the vision of God, to receive what God wants us to receive. We got to get in position for that. We have to be in the right place and the right posture to actually hear from God. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. We looked at this last week, but we're going to go with it and continue another layer this week. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So stop doing it the way they're doing it, man. Stop Stop conforming just because that's what everyone does and how it's done, man. Let's stop conforming to the pattern. There's a whole different pattern, a whole different rhythm that God wants to show you. It doesn't run in line and in step to the beat of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the what? The, the renewing of our mind. See, I believe God is constantly trying to speak to us. He's, he is constantly transmitting to us, but unless you're tuned in, you're never going to hear God's word. You're never going to get the revelation that God desires you to get, to, to receive, because we're just not tuned in on the right frequency. We're not renewed in our mind. And it's only, as we talked about last week, it's only the renewed mind that can receive the revelation and the resources of the kingdom of heaven. Now, a transformed life means a transformed mind. That's what that means. God wants to change your life, but he's going to change it by changing the way that you think it's the reason why repentance, in the Greek, metanoia, it means to change your mind. That's literally what it means, to change your mind, to, to now think from a different perspective. I don't live my life from the same perspective before I knew Jesus. I live from a totally different perspective, a perspective of the kingdom of heaven from heaven to earth, not just earthly perspective. Then, he says, then when you renew your mind, you will be able to test and approve. Somebody say approve. To approve the will of God. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, approving God's will doesn't mean my stamp on it. Like, okay, God, you're, that's, that's your will. That's not what he means. And I think that sometimes when we read verses like this, if you've been around church for a while, you might overlook the powerful implication of what we just read. I remember, I wasn't raised in church. I remember when I first read this when I was 21 years old, and this jumped off the scriptures at me, that, 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 that this verse, do you understand that this verse literally says that you can actually know the will of God? But not just know it, but you need to test and approve the will of God. What is God's will? Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, 
how do we pray? You're praying like, man, when you pray, things happen, dude. How do we pray like that? And then he gave him the Lord's Prayer, which a lot of people just recite as a memory verse, which isn't like there's, there's power in memorizing the scriptures. But when Jesus gave the disciples the what we call the Lord's Prayer, which isn't even the Lord's Prayer, it was our prayer that he gave to us, but it was actually a model of prayer that we were to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, he says, may your kingdom come. That's how he begins. Hey, this is how I want you to pray, you guys. Your kingdom come. God, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, sometimes the interpretation of this verse is, is, is uh, interpreted wrongly to to, and even some translations of, of your Bible may say, may, may say, may your kingdom come soon, which is, which is, I don't believe the accurate interpretation of this verse at all. Jesus is not telling us to pray for the return of Christ and his kingdom. He's actually talking about his kingdom in operation right now. He's saying, this is what I want you guys to pray. Hey guys, you want to learn how to pray like me? Pray this, God, may the reign of your kingdom that you've given me access to by the renewing of my mind, may the reign of your kingdom be accomplished through your will on earth as it is in heaven through me. That's what he's praying, that he has given you that much authority that you would, that you would be able to test and approve to know the will of God and advance his kingdom, the same kingdom, the heavenly will of God, whatever is operation in heaven, he wants to actually operate on earth through you. See, I think some of the things that, that you think are, you're waiting for the return of Christ for actually are supposed to be happening now through the renewed mind of Christ, not through the return of Christ. Did you catch that, you guys? That there are some things that you're waiting for the return of Christ for, but God says, no, no, no. You, you, you actually have access to that through the renewed mind of Christ right now. You got access to bring my will and my kingdom on earth just as it is in heaven. In fact, I want you to ask for it. Pray this way. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the Apostle Paul tells us that, that we, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, that in that posture and place that, that we can from there test and approve the will of God. But what does it mean to approve? It's not the stamp of approval. Let me give you an an analogy of this. I want you to pretend with me uh, that, that you bought a house east coast somewhere, I don't know, Philadelphia or something like that because, you know, the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl. But uh, Philadelphia, and say they got an attic up there, right? You bought this house and, and, and like they got an attic up there and among all the, you know, Eagles stuff that's up there, you, you, you uncover a, a painting, a beautiful painting. It looks very old. But upon further inspection of this painting, you see an inscription on it, and the inscription says Van Gogh. And you think to yourself, could it be a real, but then in your question, like, it could not be a real Van Gogh. This is, I, no way this is a real Van Gogh. This actually happened, by the way, in 2013. I'll show you the picture of this, this painting somebody found in their attic, and uh, they did what probably you would do, and you take it to some sort of artwork authority, some people that could do forensic analysis on this thing. Hey, tell me what, like, oh, is this really Van Gogh? And what they do, the forensic analysis, takes some time, because they expose it to a lot of different light, like real light, infrared light, ultraviolet light, x-ray light. They're just like looking, they examine every brush stroke of a piece of art to determine um, if it is like, you know, fake or or real. So after some time, they actually come back to this person who found this piece of art in their attic, and they say, this is an authentic Van Gogh that has, we thought, didn't even, we didn't even know existed. I mean, there's, it's been like, I don't know, 100-something years since a Van Gogh piece was ever discovered. So what, what was just a moment ago worth $50 and now on this side of that conversation is worth an excess of $50 million. This piece of art is called Sunset at Mont Majeure. And you can, I mean, it's in display in the Van Gogh Art Museum today, okay? Um, what happened? What was the difference? You know what the difference was? It was approved. Be careful what you approve. 
What you approve, you give value to. What you approve, you give worth to. Or maybe by your approval, you are devaluing some things. See, the, the value of this piece of art, the reality is it, it was always Van Gogh. It was always. So it was always inherently Van Gogh and was valuable. It was always. But I would not be able to access the value that was inherent in it if I did not approve it correctly. Are you seeing this, you guys? So, so we are called to test and approve the will of God, and you, you got to be careful what you are approving or ma- what you're making agreement with, that it is in line with the kingdom of God, the wisdom of heaven, the will of God for your life. Say you get a report from, from a doctor, and, 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 or someone does. Say they get a report from a doctor, and they got some, some illness, maybe a cancer or something. Here is the, the cancer. Here it is. This is how far it's spread, and, and, and you have some people praying for you, and one of your friends prayed for you and had a dream. It comes to you, I had a dream. They say this, I had a dream from God, and I feel like God was telling me that this, was, this actually is the will of God, but it was only going to be a time in your life, and it, was, it is intended to work out good, and God is going to deliver you from this and work good out and through this in your life. And then the next day, you have another friend who comes to you and said, I had a dream. I feel like God is saying that this is an attack of the devil. This is not God. And you need to rebuke this thing as an attack of the devil out of your life. Well, what happened there? You were presented with two pieces of art, both with the signature Van Gogh on it. And what you need to do is examine every brushstroke to determine what gets your approval. Okay? Because we are to test and approve. See, the, the, the title today is... Um, knowing the will of God, like what is God's will? And what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna help you do this year, what I hope to do, is to help you focus on the will of God for your life. Instead of your will for your life or someone else's will for your life, that this year you would focus on the will of God for your life. But even as we talk about the will of God, how do we know what it is? I don't even think it's, it's not even accurate to say the will of God. I made it my title, but I think it's more accurate, accurate to say this. How do I know what to approve? It's not necessarily how do I know what God's will is, it's how do I know what to approve in my life. I mean, is this idea from God or is it of Satan? Is this situation from God or is it from the devil? Is this, is this idea from myself or did I eat back carne asada tacos last night? What happened here? How do I know? What's the, what's, what is the approval process? What is the process to get to a place of, that I approve something as God's direction and will for my Life. First John chapter 4, verse 1 tells us this. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. That's, that word test is the same word that was translated approve in Romans 12, 2. He's talking, don't, don't believe every spirit, but approve, test and approve the spirits to see whether they are from God. See, I think this is the challenge. Like, a lot of us, we're, where our challenge comes in discerning the will of God in our life is because of this right here. I think we want to approve the direction when we are called and what we should be doing is, getting, is testing and approving the spirits. So here's how we pray. God, is it this or that? Do I go right or left? Is this the person I'm supposed to marry or not? Is this a relationship or not? Is this a job or not? Is this, and what you want is God to give you a stamp of approval on the direction, and God does not work. It, God's will is so much deeper than the direction. It's so much deeper. Is that right or wrong? God doesn't care so much about the right actions as the right heart. Now, if he gets the right heart, it produces right actions. And so many of our prayers are like, is this the right action? And God, like, you got to know how to test and approve the spirits, not just testing the direction. Are you with me on this, you guys? Okay. So, so how do we get to this place then to test and approve the spirits and, and to discern the will of God in our life? How can we go deeper, man, that we would truly, truly understand the will of God and advance his kingdom and his will <laughs> On earth as it is in heaven through, through me. Now, that's what I want to talk to. I'm going to give you nine questions today that are going to help you test and approve. To test, to know what to approve in your life. Nine questions. And by the way, all nine of them are important. Meaning, what I want you to do in this list, I'm going to give you the nine questions, man, to operate in the wisdom of heaven instead of the wisdom of this world. Okay? 
you got to go through these nine questions. You can't get four of them affirmed and five of them not and think that you got the will of God. Okay? you gotta, you got to be able to get a, a well-rounded affirmation uh, from the full counsel of God's word and his wisdom in order to know or discern or to approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God in your life. Now, James tells us if any of you lacks wisdom, the wisdom of heaven, what does he say? Ask God. He gives generously to all. To all. He doesn't even fault find it. He wants you to know his will. My hope today is to equip you to know what to approve, to approve the will of God, that, that you would that you would hear that voice, as Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 says, he says that you would hear a voice, a gentle voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Oh, wouldn't that be beautiful? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be powerful to, to as you are walking through life, knowing how to discern, to test, and approve that through this process of, uh, of, of approving God's will, that through the process, you'd hear the voice of God in your life saying, oh, this is the way, walk in it. I believe the... Data says that, that I was researching, that we have 5,000 decisions we're making every day. Among those 5,000 decisions, there's only probably a few of them that have some big implications um, that are weightier, that are more important, that, that affect our future, our health, maybe our family, or children, or our marriage, or key relationships, our calling. There might be a few of those, but I believe that you're here on purpose, and there are some decisions that hang in the balance for you. And some decisions that maybe that you've been wrestling with. Some decisions that are challenging that you would really love to know what the will of God is today. And what I've been praying for and what I hope today happens that, is that through just testing and approving and showing you the questions in the word, that you'd hear his voice today. That you'd hear the whisper of God say, this is the way. Walk in it. Some wisdom from heaven. In fact, before I even give you the questions, can I just pray that? Can we pray that together, you guys? that we'd hear from him in the middle of our, of our questions, in the middle of our challenges. God, I pray that as we study your word, we open our hearts to you, Lord, that, that, that we, as we test and approve, as we test the spirits, that you would show us your will, God, that we would hear your voice leading us in the way to walk in today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, let me give you a caveat before I jump into these questions, though. There is no such thing as a perfect decision. There's, there isn't. Perfection is, a, is an illusion, you guys. That's, there's no such thing. There are wise choices and unwise choices. There are choices that come from the wisdom of this world, and there are choices that come from the wisdom of heaven. But even when we access the wisdom of heaven, it's still not going to be perfect because you're not. And we live in an imperfect world. So do not expect perfect outcomes as you measure outcomes. Do not expect perfect conditions as you measure conditions. What we need to be submitted to is the wisdom of heaven, his will. Amen? Okay, so let me give you the nine questions. And through this, more than just writing notes, I pray the Holy Spirit breathes on you and speaks to you today. Here's number one. Am I in my renewed mind? That's the first question. Am I in my renewed mind? Now, we talked in detail about this last week. You can go check that out, how to focus on the renewing of our mind. But, but you all know, or maybe you do need to know, that we are triune in being. We are made of body, soul, and spirit. You cannot listen to your body because your body constantly craves the things of this world. You cannot listen to the appetite of your body. And you can't listen to your soul because your emotions are so fluctuating and up and down. You only, the spirit part of you is the only part of you that's like God. And so the question here is, is, the, is your spirit man in charge? Or are your emotions in charge? Who's calling the shots right now? Am I, am I being transformed? Am I in the renewing of my mind? So you can't make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. I, there's an acronym for this. It's HALT, H-A-L-T, okay? Never make a decision from these states when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. You make the worst decisions when you are hungry, angry. Sometimes those are combined as hangry. I mean, you know Anyone get hangry up in here? Okay. Don't make decisions when you're hangry. That's not the best time. Or when you're lonely or tired, you need to pause and wait and make sure that you're in a place where you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind and your spirit man is at the helm of this thing and not my emotions or my body. So we need to learn how to transform our emotions, right, into actions that are deliberate, thoughtful, spirit-aligned 
responses, but that's the first question. I need to, I, before I make a decision, man, am I in my renewed mind? Is the spirit man the one calling the shots? Number two, what possible motives are driving my decision? What are some possible motives here that are at work underneath the surface of my heart? We all have to realize this. We all have to admit this. We all have blind spots. Can we all agree in here? You have, this is so important for you to understand when you're trying to see the will of God, to discern and test and approve the will of God. You and I, we all have blind spots, and we have to honestly assess our motives before God and the Holy Spirit, even our good and bad. God, test my motives. What are the motives that are driving this decision? Proverbs 16 and 2 says, all a person's ways seem pure to them. Like, like you got a good reason for why you're feeling the way you're feeling and doing the way you're doing and reacting the way. I mean, you got, it seems pure, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Even when you are convinced that you're absolutely right and justified, it doesn't give you the right or justifi justification to create more harm to those around you. See, a lot of times, we can be more focused on doing the right thing instead of having the right heart. Let's be honest. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but I know I have. There are times where I was absolutely positively right and justified, but how I responded was not right. But how I responded, that's what needed to change. Sometimes your motives are more readily observed in hindsight. Yeah. You know, it's a, moving into it, that's the discipline we all would love to have, to, that I would be able to see my motive before I make the decision. But if you're not quite there, you have the awareness to see the motive before the decision, then ask this question of yourself after the decision. Like, like, like how, why did I react that way? Why did, I, why did I get so angry? Why did I respond that way? Why did I, why did I yell? What is it in my past or in myself that caused those feelings and reactions? Because hindsight gives insight for foresight. Hindsight gives insight for foresight. So we're testing and approving. We're approving the spirits. What's motivating me? What spirit am I being motivated by? What's, what's behind this? See, because you could have the right action, but you're motivated by the wrong spirit. I'm telling you, what you will have is the wrong kingdom reigning in your life. Number three, does it agree with the Bible? Does, this, does, this, does, it, does it agree with the Word of God? Another way of answering this question is, what principles should actually be forming my decision of God's Word? What principles of God's Word should be forming or basing my decision? If you don't know the Word of God, then you will not live by its principles. You're going to live by life's pressures, not God's principles. Based upon this pressure that you're experiencing, you're going to make certain decisions. You're going to make decisions based on feeling instead of faith. Is it, does, does this line up? Does this agree with the word of God? Because God will never contradict what he's already said. Jesus said in Luke 21, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. See, truth is, is, is never new. It's, truth is not new. It's, it's like been around forever. Fads change. Culture changes, even science changes, but the truth of God's word is forever. See, the majority of God's will for your life, listen, the majority of it is found right here in God's word. All you gotta do is read it. All you gotta do is, is, is get, and so so many of us, we don't have the devotion or the, the, the discipline to read God's word, so when you make decisions, you're, you're wanting to throw a lifeline up to God and trying to get an answer, and what's going to happen often is God is going to point you back to his word, but if the word ain't in you, something else inside of you is going to come up. You're going to get a word, but it's not the word of God. You're going to make an approval or an agreement with something based on a feeling or, or some impression that you're getting, but you're going to make an agreement with the wrong spirit. All we got to do is read it. It's here. It's right here, you guys. And if you know your Bible, the enemy can't trick you. The enemy can't dupe you. If you know your word, a witness will rise up in you. No, no, no. Wait a second. Man shall live by, by bread alone, by every mouth that comes from the word of God. No, 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 no. No, worship him and him only, devil. No, I'm not bowing down. No, 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 wait a second. This is contradictory to what I know and I've stored up in my heart. Does this agree with the Bible? Number four, do I have all the facts? 
another caveat here. Can I just tell you something real quick? This is an important one, but you also need to know that facts bow down to truth. Okay? Because remember, fads change, culture change, science changes. Just because something is culturally factual now doesn't mean that it is truth. It's, it is God's truth. It might be cult, a fact culturally, but it's not a truth theologically. <laughs> and that fact is going to bow down to Jesus. Okay, so you, but but when, you're, when you're making a decision and you're testing and approving, you want to make sure you do have all the facts. There's a reason why 90% of businesses fail, business startups. There's a reason why 80% of church startups, they actually fail. I call it uneducated enthusiasm. People are really passionate, but they don't have the wisdom, the calling, or the anointing to do what, what, what they want to do. Proverbs 18 and 13 says this, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. How many times have you actually responded to something, you, whether by word or action, and you wish, man, I wish I knew what I knew now. I wish I had all the facts. I wish I heard it all. See, you can't be too quick to condemn or criticize. Don't assume you know people's motivations because you probably don't. Don't decide before knowing all the facts. Proverbs 18 and 17 says, any story sounds true until someone tells the other side and sets the record straight. This is so important for you to, to, like, it's very neglected. One of the oft-neglected principles of God's word when we're actually trying to give good counsel and we're trying to maybe help someone through a conflict, we forget, man, that this is just one side of the story. And, and, and I'm accidentally, man, I'm, if, I, if I don't remember that there's another side, I may give hasty, false advice. I may give bad counsel here. I may approve something that I should have never approved in this person's life. And I led them astray. Okay, because this wasn't, this wasn't all the facts. Number five, have I sought godly counsel? Have I sought godly counsel? There's a lot of things, uh, weighty decisions that you don't need to carry by yourself. This is why you need to be in a group here at Discovery, man. You need to be around some other believers, some other followers of Christ, some some mature leaders or pastors, you just need to be around people to give you godly counsel. It doesn't matter how mature you are, how faithful you are, how, how much of the Bible you know. Every single one of us have those blind spots in need. God uses godly counsel. You see it operating all throughout the scriptures, but one of the most prevalent examples is in the life of Moses, where Moses, who was the man who stood face to face before God, Mo, he was the one who actually God talked to and spoke through and got the commandments and the will of God for the people. Like this was someone, if, who can cancel him, man? He's got God's ear and God's face. Yet here he is, you know, and, and the way he's leading God's people, he actually was meeting everybody in every conflict resolution, every case that there was. He was meeting with them and trying to deal with everybody and care for everybody and make sure everyone was cared for and resolved. And, and he was wearing himself out. He was going to have a burnout and breakdown, no matter how holy or awesome he was. He was going to break down, and Jethro, his father-in-law, sees it and gives him godly counsel and advice says, and told him such. He said, hey, you're going you're gonna to burn yourself out. You're not to carry these people's burdens alone. You need to empower other people according to the capacity that God has given them. Some people can lead 10 or 50 or 100 or 1,000. You need to step back and only reserve yourself for getting before God's face and handling the most important matters, okay? And so he takes that advice and says, okay, you're right. You know, I can't care for every single person, man. I gotta, I gotta let other people do some caring. I gotta let other people do some wisdom and counsel and I just need to, I need to get before God's face, and I need to make sure that the, the, the more important things get my, get my attention. And he submitted to that, to that counsel. Proverbs 11 and 14 says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. See, seeking wise counsel, it's a sign of maturity, and it's a sign of humility. But when you're seeking counsel, you also need the discernment to know, is this wise counsel or poor counsel? Okay, because ultimately, you're not trusting in man. We don't trust in man. We're trusting in God who uses man to accomplish his will and give wisdom to my life. Ultimately, I'm trusting in God. See, sometimes you, you got to have discernment because sometimes people just tell you what, you what they think you want to hear. So you got to be careful when seeking godly counsel and wise counsel. But that is, a, that is an area where God will speak to you. He'll speak to you and affirm some things in your life through godly counsel. Number six. Ask yourself this question as you approve the will of God. 
is this even my responsibility? Is this my responsibility? See, this question, this is a question you would need to ask before you go on a, fa- a fact-finding journey, okay? So when you ask yourself the question, do I have all the facts, that can provide you with a good perspective so you don't come to a hasty conclusion. But sometimes the facts, all the facts, are none of your business. It's not your business. It's not your responsibility. And with seeking God's will, why would God give you his will for somebody else's responsibility? Never seek God's will for somebody else's life. Unless they are under your responsibility, you don't need to be seeking their will. Amen. God's will. Amen. Now look, no, seek, seek, their, seek, if you got children, you know what I mean? Seek God's will for, the, for, for your children, their direction of, of your children. Or maybe if you're a leader and you have like a group that you're leading, a team that you're leading, please pray and seek the wisdom of God and the will of God for the people that God has called you to care and to lead. But if you are not responsible for somebody, stop seeking the will of God for them. God works through divine authority. He'll work through, he'll speak, okay? So stop, stop. I, there was a while ago, there was someone who actually, um, who, was, who was trying to give people words. You ever have someone give you a word? I give you a word. But they were, they were giving people, they were giving people a word from God based upon information that they were privy to. They had access to certain information, and so they would give people words based upon their information that they had, but it was a word from God. And, and man, you know what that is? That's a spirit of Jezebel. That is a manipulative, controlling, selfish spirit that, that I don't even know where that came from. That's not in my notes, but y'all need to be, maybe someone in here needs to know, you need to, you need to stop fact-finding where the facts aren't your responsibility. You need to stop, you don't need to, you don't need to draw a, a concrete conclusion about the matter because the matter isn't your responsibility. What you need to do is leave it to God. What you need to do is understand there's more to this story and I'm going to guard my heart. Romans chapter 14, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. So then each of us will give an account of himself, not others. You're going to give an account of ourselves to God. So whatever you believe about these things, look what he says. Keep it between yourself and God. No one needs to know what you think about them and their will and what they believe God's will is. Hey, if it ain't your responsibility, just keep it between you and God. Okay. Y'all getting something out of this? Y'all getting some wisdom? Testing and approving the will of God? I'm just like, what if we did? What if we focused on accomplishing his will, not our will? What if we said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? That's my focus, God. It's not my kingdom, but your kingdom through me, God. I want your will, okay? I hesitated on including this number seven in because it's used out of context a lot, but I'm gonna help you out with it, okay? Number seven is this. Do I sense God's peace? Do I sense God's peace? Very like You should be seeking the peace of God, but (laughs) Christians often say, well, I prayed about it, and I have peace about it. A while ago, I had a friend of mine that, you know, they made a major decision in their life that actually ended up in the, in the destruction of their family, um, the, the separation of a marriage and their family. And uh, I spoke with him about the wrong thinking that was controlling some of the actions that he was making. And his reply was a very common reply I hear. I hear well, I prayed about it, and I just had peace about it. And I was amazed, I was astonished that a mature follower of Jesus could actually believe that, that in, in, in answer to a prayer to God that he would give someone peace to lead their family into, an, into destruction and a marriage into collapse. I, the Lord does intend to lead you by his peace. He does. He wants to give you, give you peace. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But this promise, it's often wrongly used. Some people, what they really want, and they're, when they say, oh, I feel, you know, I just, I sense peace about it. What they're really saying is they sense a peaceful outcome, not the peace of God. Why in the world? I, I wish there were more, more followers of Jesus that actually said, well, I feel peace about something that is leading them into enduring pain. Why is it every time you say you feel God's peace, it's the, easy, it's the path of least resistance? 
When we see in God's word, oftentimes he'll lead us into areas and times where it is painful, where we need to persevere, where we need to endure. I mean, I think if we were really sensing God's peace and we'd say, man, in the, even though this is a hard decision and, and, I, and I really don't even want to, I sense in the middle of it God's peace. See, when you say and you're looking for God's peace, you're not looking for a peaceful outcome. You're not looking for a peaceful feeling. You're looking for the hand of God and the presence of God in the middle of a pain, difficulty, or a storm. Like that's, I, I, I know God is calling me to, it's going to be hard, my gosh, I don't, but, but I sense that God's, I sense his peace in this decision. But he, yes, please seek his peace, but make sure you're not looking, you're not seeking peaceful outcome, but the peace of God, okay? What you're looking for is the peace of God. Do I have God's peace? I know, even though it's a difficult decision, it's hard. It's a hard decision, man, that God's, but I have God's peace even though it's hard. Number eight, does it make me more like Christ? Does it make me more like, look, this is the chief aim of God's will in your life right here, that you would be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you would take on the character, the conduct, the nature of Jesus. Here's, I think that a lot of us, we, this is such a lofty, impossible goal that we don't even take it into consideration. When we're approving the will of God in our life, we don't examine, like, is this going to make me more like Jesus? Because you feel like it's such a far-off thing, but this is God's goal for you. He wants you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and take on the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. Look what Romans 8 says, verse 29. From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and all along he, he knew you would, should become like his son. That is God's goal for your life. Hey, in this decision that I want to make or I'm about to make or I need to make, is this going to make me more like Jesus? In what ways more like Jesus? Well, I'm in his incarnation. Yeah, he was God embodied, right? God wants to embody you and fill you. Is this going to make me more like the spirit-filled, empowered follower of Jesus? Is this, am I going to, am I going to be like Jesus in his service, in his love, in his patient endurance, in his mission? Is this making me more like Christ. Ephesians 4.22 says, everything connected to that old way of life that you used to live has to go. It's rotten through and through. So get rid of it and then take on an entirely new way of life. He says, a God fashion life. It's not, you're not a refurbished you. You're not a better version of you. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be like his son. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. That's what God desires, to reproduce his character in you. Is this going to make me more like Christ? And then lastly, number nine, simply asking, is it my will or God's will? Like, is this my will I mean, you got to draw some alarms and red flags if every time God's will is, I think this is God's will in my life, if it always agrees with your own will for your life. Red flag, right? Like, like, are you being led by your personality and your preferences and your feelings? Or is, is, is God in there at all driving this thing? Is this my will or is this God's will? You know, in Isaiah chapter 14, the prophet recounts Lucifer, the angel, the fallen angel from heaven. And in that whole chapter, it, it, it states over and over again, Lucifer states, I will, I will, I will, I will. You know what the, the, the two words that capture the heartbeat of Lucifer is? I will. I will. Jesus was the opposite. He said, thy will be done. Matthew 26, 39. My father, if it's possible, look at Jesus. May this cup be taken from me. Like, I don't want to do this. This is hard. Crucifixion hard, being beaten by a whip with, with nails on it, I hard, this is hard, yet not as I will, but as you will, okay? What would it look like, you guys, if we truly this year focused on the will of God, his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Uh, I think every one of us are on the journey of God's will. We're, we're probably on in, in one of three phases, and I'm going to conclude with this, you guys. One of the three phases of God's will, you're in one of these three phases, okay, today. Here's the first phase. It's simply, I want what I want, you know? That's a, see, mo, I really don't want your will. I, I, want, I have a plan that I want you to bless. 
And that's what some of us are, and it's reflected in the way you pray. You come and you pray and you ask God, I want more money, I want a better job, I want a better husband, fix them, God, fix my kids, fix that, do this, do that. And it's, and you really, you just want what you want. You're, there's nothing inside of you that's crying out for the will of God and the kingdom of God. It's just crying out for your kingdom and your will. When James chapter 4, he tells us how to, how to pray. He goes, hey, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He said, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, this is how you ought to talk to God. If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I want what I want. Some of you are at that place in your journey of God's will. You just, you don't really think about his will much. You more think about how he can do your will. Okay? But many of us along this journey of faith, we kind of eventually, God working in us and transforming us, eventually we kind of want God's will. Kind of. So we get to this phase two, which is, I want what, God's want, what God wants, but... Or maybe for you it's an if. You might put if there, or I want what God wants if. I want what God wants, but, you know, you can, like, how many of you know that our butts can get in the way of God's perfect will, the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God? Because we want both. I want what God wants, but I also want what I want. Can we, get, can we compromise here, God? Is there a middle ground here? Can we just, like, we want what God wants with certain conditions, there was this young man who was called a rich young ruler that came to Jesus, and, and he wanted like to follow Jesus. He wanted what God wanted, but look what it says in Mark chapter 10. He actually asked if he can follow him. What does he need to do to be a disciple of his? And Jesus looked at him and loved him, it says. He goes, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, from, come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad. He went away. Some of you, you went away because you had a condition. You knew what God wanted you to do. You knew it was his will for you to do that. And you went away sad. And some of us are on that part of the journey where we just, we want what God wants, but, you know, Matthew chapter 6, 33, it's not in your notes, but Jesus, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know, the, our main problem, all of our problems come from seeking the things that were supposed to be added. See, when you, when you seek the things, you miss the kingdom. But when you seek the kingdom, he adds the things. And you think, like, like by, your, by your conditions, but, nip, and they, like, you think those things are going to be taken from you, but you don't realize that he owns it all. Here's where I want us to get to. I want us to get to this third phase this year that we would truly focus on God's will, like his will, not mine. So write it down like this. I want what God wants, period. Don't put a condition on it. Don't put a but. Don't put an if. Just, I want what God wants, Period. There really is a better way than my way. It's God's way. 1 John 2 and 17 says, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now, that's a daily process. It really is. There are so many decisions. You're 5,000 of them you're making every day, and some of them are more important. Some of them have more implication. But what would it look like this year if we truly stopped if we didn't make those decisions based upon the wisdom of this world, but on, based on the wisdom of heaven? that we actually tested and approved the Spirit, that we had a process, a process to discern. Is this God? Is this His will? Because I honestly, God, I don't want mine. I want yours. Now, some of you are, are here and maybe you've never even said anything like that. Maybe you've never truly come to that place where you're like, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the challenge I'm making today. For us to live this life, of to fix our focus, 
that you would focus on that, that it, this year that we would focus on doing and accomplishing His will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What would it look like if you got out of the way? If your goals and your ambitions and your life and your, all of it got out of the way, the things that you're looking for and you're seeking got out of the way and you sought first His kingdom and His righteousness. What would that look like? I bet you, listen, He would add the things. If you sought Him first, your will, not mine. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.